Well met, everyone. I am Rich the Lich. Today, we are going to make a monster. I'll do the best I can as I have not had my coffee yet. So, you know what? As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to cut, edit, take a break on this video so that I can jump over into the kitchen and grab my coffee and be a bit more creatively refreshed. Let's talk through this. So, on screen here, we have a polar bear. This is a CR2. Yep. Challenge two monster, and let me yeah, let me back up a little bit. What I want to do is I want to show you how simple it is, and I'd say accurate because you're just going off of what's listed, what's on screen. How simple it is to use any monster that you want, regardless of what tier of gameplay your group is at. I think what happens is too often. We may have this wide range of monsters, right? Like, so for example, if I, if I look at D&D Beyond here, I'm fortunate that I have all of the content, basically the legendary bundle, everything that's officially been released thus far. So what it results in is if I use the little monster tab, and this is how I plan all of my D&D sessions, it allows for a certain level of efficiency. We've got 83 pages of monsters from all sorts of sources, okay? Obviously, the monster manual, whatever's in Volo's guide, things that are inside Dungeon of uh, the Mad Mage or whatever it's called, and so on and so forth, okay? So you've got all this good stuff in all varying levels of CRs, and when you get into the things like Princes of the Apocalypse, I think, and there's a couple of the guild leaders in Ravnica, you're looking at some CR20-something creatures. But what happens is, while the breath and the scope of the amount of monsters I have, whatever those words are, I think there's 20 monsters per page times 83 pages. I don't know what the math is there, but we've got 1,000 monsters or something like that. But in D&D, too often I think what happens from the DM perspective is once the PCs reach level 2, 3, 4, right? They start hitting that second tier of gameplay. You chunk off 25% of those monsters, as DMs, it can often become a situation where we feel like we can't use any of the one-eighth, one-quarter, one-CR monsters anymore. They're just too easy. You know, there's always a point where at the epic highest level of gameplay, tier four, okay, world-ending cataclysmic stuff, it's hard to bring to the table a kobold when your PCs just finished fighting ancient reds and beholders and mind flayer lords and such. Okay, once you escalate up to giants, you've gone past the humanoids of hobgoblins and orcs and so on. So one thing I want to show you is a way that you can simply sort of pick anything you want and not be constrained to environmental concerns. So if you're looking at, you can filter by environment. So if I want to do a random encounter in the Arctic, that polar bear might come up, but it's not going to pull up the adult black dragon because he's in a swamp. But maybe you just feel like using an adult black. Maybe you feel that vibe. Sure, you can use an adult white dragon if you're in the Arctic. So that's kind of a, a bad example based on what was on screen there. But I think you, you get where I'm going with this is you don't have to be restricted to these various filters of these are only evil monsters. Because yes, there's 83 pages on t with 20 monsters per page. But if I really filtered out all of the, uh, the anything that's good aligned, you're going to think, I can't use those. I can't use planetars. I can't use devas. I can't use the good align. I, I can't use a brass or a bronze dragon. But I like their elements. You know, there's a difference between what a gold dragon can do for a breath weapon than what a red dragon does. Red dragon, of course, has the iconic fire. But a gold, I don't know what a gold has right here. Obviously, it's going to be more powerful as an ancient. But like weakening breath. It reduces strength at a high DC, DC 21 for the gold. So it's what, DC 24 for the ancient? You know, giving them disadvantage on strength-based attacks, strength checks, strength saving throws. That's a dragon that is more dangerous to martial classes than perhaps the fire dragon is, th than the red is. So maybe you want to use that. But we start to get into this narrow-minded focus as a DM sometimes, myself included, where we think, well, we can't use the gold because he's a good dragon. And my PCs are heroes and they're fighting the good fight and they're going against evil only. So we filter that out, 
right? And then we think, oh, well, they're only, I only need things in the Arctic, so I can't use anything from the desert. Yes, there are certain things that thematically just don't fit. Don't use sharks and aquatic animals unless you have some weird level of magic in the middle of the forest, right? Because there's no water and where is he, you know, whatever. Maybe you can have a, a weird hidden lake that was never known before to be in that forest and there's a shark in there. But there are certain, you know, certain limitations. But what I mean by building a monster and the way you can make sure it's fair, okay? We're not talking about, I've made an earlier video sometime early last year or whatever, mid last year, where we went through the, we went through the list in the DMG, detailing out all of the bits about, you know, I want to give it reckless. I want to give it resistance to magic. I want to up its... AC by one point and I want to double its hit points. You know, there are little tables and things you can go through to kind of help you wrangle that in to figure out how that might affect its CR so that you don't come to the table with what you intended to be a CR1 orc and he's now a CR7 orc, right? Because that's going to change the dynamics of that fight. But what I'm talking about here is bringing a level appropriate thing. Okay, if you know your PCs are level 8, what is the, the CR? And I know CR can get very wonky. I've been using a lot of the stuff in Xanathar's Guide to help guide me through the process of creating a challenging encounter. You have a group of four level 8s, right? So a CR 8 is a decent monster for that fight. But what I can do is I can remove all the constraints of whether he's good, whether he's evil, what environment he's in. Let's take this guy for example. Now, the fact that he's undead gives him a wide range of environmental options, okay? Because you can reasonably have the the creature there in almost any environment. When you're thinking environment, just come up with a cool story for why that thing might be there, okay? Good, bad creature doesn't matter. Arctic versus desert doesn't matter. Come up with some reason. All you have to do is just say that there's a polar bear that was tainted by the the world effect that's affecting everyone up in the north is it's the presence of this demon gate, this demon portal. They didn't know that they were placing it out there in the in the Arctic, okay, in Siberia. But the demons entered through this portal, and just the presence of these pit fiends, baylors, whatever you want to call it, that are up there has corrupted the people, right? And that's what the storyline is for the PCs. But what you've now done is you've created polar bears that can now acclimate to hotter temperatures, okay? There isn't a lot on the polar bear that specifically says, you know, like the sunlight sensitivity thing, where there are certain traits about the polar bear creature that it needs to be in the cold, okay? So that just shows you environmentally, you can come up with stories as to why something that is normally from one environment or terrain type can now be present in another terrain type. Okay, but I digress. Let's look into this ghoul. Okay, we have a ghoul, right? I know there's a ghast who's a little more powerful, but let's look into some ways that we can take this guy and use him and create a ghoul that applies at all, at, let's say three tiers of gameplay. You can make a ghoul a challenging encounter at level one for your PCs, can be very challenging at level one, all the way up to level 12 PCs that are slinging level 6, 7 spells and whatnot or whatever, okay? So let's just take a look at what's here. And this is how we can build the monster. If we look at this sheet, and I'll kind of stick it up on screen here and leave it. We have a medium undead. I oftentimes, when I write my little cheat sheets and kind of print these guys out on index cards, I just throw away the alignment stuff. It doesn't matter. The very fact that I tell you to roll initiative is indicating that you are going to fight this guy. It doesn't matter if he's good, bad, evil, or otherwise. Even the holiest, goodest of a good thing, if you do something to their loved ones, to their children, they can go evil and become murderous and just hunt you down and want to destroy you. Okay, I understand there's paladin tenets and stuff like this, but beyond that, just throw away the alignment. This thing is trying to kill you for whatever reason. It could be a territorial thing, right? You've seen videos, National Geographic, of people hanging out with bears, and then you see people that stumble upon bear cubs, and the dynamic of that same animal changes very quickly. So dismiss the alignment. You automatically remove one of the constraints. You're no longer filtering creatures to use based on how good they are or how bad, how bad they are. Okay? All you have to do also, storyline, is describe it. Have it skin falling off a little more. Have its lower mouth detached. It was corrupted by some force. A hag got a hold of it. It drank the wrong potion and its eyes are now bulging. 
So that way now you can get into the realm of the evil looking monsters and not just think, well, the good guys don't look threatening. They don't look scary. Okay. So let's dismiss that. So AC, hit points, whatever. The big thing with him is he's got ghouls have these claw attacks. That's iconic. That's been around for 40 years. If you fail saving throws, you're going to get paralyzed. Okay. That's kind of, that player is going to die. That happens enough times. They fill the saving throws. You've just TPK'd the party. Okay. But let's just take a look at some biped humanoid thing. It doesn't even have to be undead yet. Okay. That's a CR1 ghoul. Let's put that guy on screen. Let's go to a construct. Totally different, right? But it's a created thing. It's not a, an entity that needs to live, breathe, and sleep. So maybe it works in the same realm as undead. All right, let's take a look at here, animated statue. Good, good. Okay, he's got spells. Great. Okay, so here's what you do. We don't take these things and say, let's give him the ghoul time stop and then finger of death and then let's move over the damage from spells resistance thing and then hold on. He's got really high int saving throw, but then he's got magic resistance, but he only has a... D you don't move these things over and chunk them onto the ghoul template because what you're doing now is you're now having to handle all the wonky parts of how do I build that ghoul and make sure that CR is not skewed too much. No, what I'm doing is just simply take the animated statue as is. Apparently someone has already worked through this. What's he from? Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage? To determine that this guy is a CR 12 monster, period, as, as is. So we don't call him animated statue. It's an animated ghoul. It's a ghoul that, you know how you always get that thing where I know a lot of like zombies, they have undead fortitude. Every time you deal that killing blow, instead you make that saving throw. If they make it, they instead redu are reduced to one hit point and they're still up. And that can keep going, right? So it feels like we can't kill these things. But you always get that situation in undead is, is the fight over? You know, and of course the DM can say, okay, guys, we're out of initiative. You won. And they're like, no, no, are, are, are the ghouls dead, dead? Because they were already dead, right? You get that type of thing. So what you can do is you can say that this ghoul... Obviously, whatever it was, it died. This human died. It became an undead known as a ghoul. That ghoul was later killed. But then through experiment, through some sort of mad goblin magic, this little goblin guy, this alchemist, an herbalist, a medicine man, whatever you want to call him, some wizard necromancer specialty dabbled with the undead okay he just came upon this field and he brought all these undead so instead of bringing humans to torture and people like that to experiment on he brought in undead he brought in ghouls and he created a construct an animated ghoul that's it there's your story that's it you don't need more than that why can't that work in a world with freaking flying ships in a world with demon gates but I understand there's the, what are they, the tropes, the stereotypes. You know, World of Warcraft has a demonic invasion in Legion. Therefore, demons invade. Why can't kobolds invade? From where? I don't know where they invaded from. But kobolds are causing, an, you know, ruckus and mayhem throughout the world because in large, zergling, Starcraft-influenced quantities, they are just porting in from their kobold plane of kobolds. Okay, they don't exist as you know them on the world. Okay, why can't kobolds port in? Why is it that only the dragons, you know, dominate the skies? Why don't you just have a bunch of, I don't know what they're called, the, the mind flayers that are spellcastery, the, the alhoon or something like this. Why don't mind flayers with freaking angel wings just float around the sky? So use the animated statue just as is. Exactly. You don't have to do anything else. Look back to the ghoul and just remember that the only thing I might want to give here is with his dagger attack, if you take damage from that, and it's not much. I mean, that's the least threatening thing he has. But maybe add the paralyzation onto, onto that, okay? Maybe just play around with one of these spells. I, I don't want to look through the spell list. That's going to take too long in the video. But remove one of those third, fourth, fifth level spells and add in the spell that paralyzes a, a person, a creature. Maybe that's how they do it, okay? Maybe just make it simple of saying, okay, you know, if, uh, let's just say, for example, third level, 
is some sort of, I don't know what the hell the spell is. Hold person? Hold monster? Okay. That you're paralyzed if you fail to save? Let's just say, I just say, he has no counter spell. He has no fly. He has no lightning bolt. All he has is hold person. Okay. And if you make it a point to say that this animated ghoul, first thing he opens up with is he always just spends all three of his sl third level slots to hold, hold, hold. It reminds the players, okay, this thing looks ghoulish, but I don't know what it is. It has these like metal plates as though the ghoul was further enhanced into something more. But it creates this scary encounter for those level 12s. And then the minute that he's doing that, the PCs think, man, this thing really is kind of ghoulish. Because it looks nasty. It looks like some weird undead thing that's now been further enhanced. It's got tubes and vessels and, you know, all sorts of beakers hanging off of its face and whatever the hell it looks like. It looks like it went through some chemical experiment. And he's trying to do the paralyzation stuff. So that's a threat. Oh, yeah, by the way, he's got finger of death, mind blank, and time stop as well. And he's got advantage on saving throws. And he's got 100 hit points. So on and so forth. So you see how you can just simply take that and just through story, I don't now have to, you know, I don't just have to think it's a field of undead. I've only got a, a limit of undead to look through, but I want to use something else. And I think you see how you start bridging those gaps and the, the goal of the video and the point of everything here is just stop limiting your creature selection and the diversity of combat based on terrain, based on alignment, based on CR. Again, you saw, I just... Hold it right as is. I don't have to calculate out how I can take some of these spells. If I wanted to add mind blank, finger of death, and time stop to any creature, how would that skew its CR? There's a lot of work there that needs to happen. And if you do it wrong, obviously because of how powerful those spells are, you've done it wrong. So plug and play and open up your palette, whatever that means, <laughs> you know, your, your art palette. When you throw down that battle mat, you tell your PCs to roll initiative. You set the stage, you explain what the creature is, you show them a picture on your phone, your iPad, you've laid down that blank canvas. And then you start painting in broad strokes with various colors. And at the end of it, you hope you create some kind of cool artwork, which creates a memory of an awesome encounter. But let's not work with eight colors. Let's work with the 64 box of Crayola crayons. For those of you that are a lot younger, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm going to end the video there. Create your own monster. Use whatever you want. Thanks, folks. See you later.